When you first get diagnosed, you know, you feel ashamed and you think, I'm not one of them. I internalized the stigma. When I was sick, they took me to my fraternity brother, the president and treasurer, took me to the hospital. And I feel ashamed to ask them, you know, only one person could drive me, I'm not violent, you know. <laughs> and then they told me they would visit me, but no one visited me, you know. Trong. I was born in Vietnam. We lost everything because the communists came in. I was six years old. We left the first time the water came into a boat. And then we left the second time in the Malaysia, then Italy. And then um, out of all the places in the United States, we came to Akron, Ohio. <laughs> which was really cold in I was very happy in junior high and high school. I thought I had the perfect childhood as far as, you know, getting good grades, being in sports, and having friends. I took college-level classes while I was in high school. I took college-level chemistry classes at Wright State University in the summer of my 10th grade. Then I took calculus classes at the University of Dayton. The highlight of my high school year was winning the Science Olympiad, first place at state and fourth place at nationals. I did very well in high school graduating at the top of my class. I got into the University of Chicago, one of the best liberal arts schools in the nation. I was pre-med, I love medicine. I never thought that mental illness would change my life. When I was very depressed and I started feeling better, I told my psychiatrist, that, oh, I'm, I feel great now, I'm, I'm good, the depression is over, you know. But actually it triggered a mania. What does that mean? That means you go high. I start having like, I was starting to feel like, oh, I feel really good, you know, I'm happy again. Then I start having grandiose ideas. I thought, like I thought that I could make $100,000 a year leveraging the stock market. I went out and bought a brand new car for $32,000. I was on different medication and couldn't even read, write, or drive. And I thought I was going to be a zombie for the rest of my life. I have difficulty responding to medications and I have severe side effects. I mean, it's easy to take a pill to reduce the symptoms. But unfortunately, my medications don't reduce all my symptoms. It's just, it's good if I'm in crisis, you know. There's a perception that as the modern minority, they have few of any problems, they're all upwardly mobile. The reality is, yes, some of them are doing very, very well. That doesn't mean that they don't have problems. And in fact, with some of the groups who are seeing particularly with those that would appear to be, quote, the model minority. They outwardly may not have problems. They're doing well in school. They aren't getting into trouble. But that doesn't mean they're not at risk for mental health problems. And in fact, for some of them, the pressures to do well, the pressures to be perfect, actually are incredibly strong. And that in of itself can create a lot of problems. I told him, no, no anyway, you can do better than a doctor. If you're a doctor, you can help all the people. So you think you put too much pressure on him? I didn't put pressure, but oh. I gave it to him my experience. I told him my success in my business, my personal success in better field, uh, overcome everywhere, you know. Like communists arrested me to send me, to sentence me to death. I still overcome, you know, and be friendly with them too after they released me and then how would that contribute to Ken's? Because he, he, he to... you, you know, that your son, your Asian son always listened to their father. My dad would tell me that I'm not as good as he is. I will never be as good as he is. Coming to America, they lost everything. And now they have the children to look, to live. And so they care very much for their children to be successful. And as the only son, can is the hope. Nó không có học hành được, làm cho tôi rất là thất vọng. 
tương lai nó không có tương lai nên làm cho tôi buồn lắm mà tôi cũng cố gắng khuyên con tôi là thôi bây giờ mà con bệnh đau như vậy đó mà con phải ráng chịu đựng đặng mà cho phải chấp nhận cái hoàn cảnh như vậy bởi vì theo má là đạo Phật cho nên má đã đọc qua những kinh sách Phật má biết rằng những cái kiếp này mà mình khổ có thể là vì kiếp trước mình đã gây ra cái gì cái tội lỗi gì đó mình đã làm những cái gì không tốt ở kiếp trước cho nên kiếp này mình mới phải cái nghiệp của mình lòng lành lánh dữ rồi mình tạo cái nghiệp tốt nặng mình là kiếp sau mà mình mình được sung sướng hơn cái kiếp này ráng sống cho hết cái kiếp này và sống cho có ích lợi và làm làm phải làm giúp đỡ mọi người and at the same time I was brought up to be compassionate and help others so um, coming to America my compassion as a kid I was made fun of and so forth and teased but I thought oh you know I'll just be smarter than you and I'll be your boss when I grow up <laughs> I thought I was a great kid being compassionate and kind and I had problem with being discriminated when I was young and stuff I didn't know that being made fun of and teased and bullied affected my mental health who I am as a person I feel inferior because I'm not white and also a cultural conflict with my parents I guess looking back I mean, I did go in home and cry, but I didn't have anyone to talk to about being bullied. And I thought because, you know, being an immigrant had to be mature. I worked when I was young. And so I thought, oh, this is kids, you know, I forgive them for bullying me and teasing me and, you know, make my life hell or call me chink and being really mean and everything. But I didn't know that it was going to affect me psychologically until I went to therapy. And read up on love self-help books and stuff. He's a fighter. And I like that attitude. You know, I told him, you know, I, I don't think that there are many people uh, as strong as you are uh, who, who just take it positively and go on with your life. You know, some days he would get up and feel like, oh my gosh, I don't want to live. But no, he, he, he chased that negative thought away and then and try to be positive by being around friends and 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 he's proud of who he is I think that that's the part that I like about him too you know like I say he's a fighter and so I feel very fortunate that I'm in recovery that recovery is possible for everyone yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess I'm supposed to represent Asian Americans and um, Pacific Islanders. One of the problem with mental health in Asian Americans is that many times, actually for most people, it's most of the times, is we don't talk about emotions. And I pay for the consequence of that. Part of my healing process, I just need to say this, and that when I was young, you know, I know you have a temper and you never meant to hurt me. But when you hit me, it really scared me, and I'm, I'm healing from that. And that um, I don't want my past to hurt me to be able to grow and learn and to be able to manage and handle my emotions. I feel like in the past, like I was in love, you know, because of the depression. You know, I know you so love differently to food and stuff like that, but sometimes I just want a hug, you know. Our lover not open like in Western here. You Asian people always keep something in their heart. With some of the, the youth that live in two different worlds, it's very difficult to negotiate two very, very different worlds. The traditional world of the parents who are from Southeast Asia, different parts of Asia, and the kids are raised here. And there is um, not feeling like they belong to either world. I know that my dad loves me. When I was young, my dad would take me to violin lessons, even though he really couldn't afford it. <laughs> <laughs>